River Valley, a homeland that belongs to the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho Indian tribes of the Wind River Indian Reservation, a place of productive agriculture, ranches, and spectacular wilderness reaching out to the Continental Divide. irrigation project here is a historically significant part of the history of this reservation. It was an important part of a federal government plan to help the Shoshone and Arapaho move from a traditional nomadic lifestyle to one that incorporated agriculture. For many, that move has defined the lifestyle and stories of their own history, their father's history, and their grandfather's history. Today, many ranchers and farmers have continued that lifestyle move as a means to support their families and remain living on the land. Years ago, when they built that uh, irrigation project, they did, built a uh, all these uh, canals that run through you, they run from, uh, from North Fork over, and you drop off into South Fork, and then you go on into to, uh, Trout Creek from uh, South Fork, and then you go on over to, uh, I think that's, uh, I'm not sure what number that is, it's, I think it's 30, 38C, I believe, you know, it's a ditch that runs down to Duck Creek. So that, so that water is, you know, it's spread throughout the reservation on the western part of it. And the irrigation of that, you know, is, is uh, for the people, you know, that raise hay, grain, whatever, you know, up in this area. But in the lower part of the country, you know, they raise beets and, and uh, I guess, um, you know, corn and all that good other stuff, you know, so some staples for the, for, you know, for themselves to get down, you know, paid for it and everything. So. Farming and irrigation were started by white settlers living within the reservation boundary in the late 1860s. The Shoshone first began farming in the early 1870s, after Chief Washakie began expressing an interest in farming and irrigation as a means for the Shoshone to become self-sufficient. The Shoshone people belonged to a yudo aztecan linguistic family, which once stretched from the Cascades in the northwest to the northern plains of Wyoming and southward to Mexico. The Eastern Shoshone formerly roamed freely between their summer homes in eastern Idaho and their ancestral hunting grounds in the Wind River Valley in Wyoming. As pressure from the white settlements began to push tribes out of their traditional homelands, Chief Washakie determined that his people were best off moving permanently into the Wind River country, which was well known for its mild winters, abundant game, and plentiful mountain-fed streams. The Wind River Indian Reservation was established for the Eastern Shoshone Indians in 1868. Camp Augur, a military post with troops, was established at the present site of Flander on June 28, 1869. In 1870, the name was changed to Camp Brown, and in 1871, the post was moved to the current site of Fort Washakie. In 1877, Irwin obtained permission from the Shoshone to receive the Northern Arapaho onto the reservation. The Northern Arapaho tribe of Wyoming are one of four groups of Arapaho who originally occupied the headwaters of the Arkansas and Platte Rivers. They speak a variation of the Algonquin language and are that people's most southwest extension. Culturally, they are Plains Indians, but socially and historically distinct. After signing the Treaty of 1851, the Arapaho and Cheyenne then shared an encompassing one-sixth of Wyoming, one quarter of Colorado, and parts of western Kansas and Nebraska. Later, when the Treaty of 1868 left the northern Arapaho without a land base, they were placed with the Shoshone in west central Wyoming on the Wind River Reservation, arriving in March of 1878. Despite efforts made for moving to a separate reservation, such requests were ignored by the federal government. Faced with feeding the new arrivals in the upcoming year, Patton encouraged the Arapaho to begin farming. 
Construction began on an irrigation ditch off the Little Wind River near St. Michael's. Irrigation was first attempted in 1873, followed by small-scale, not very successful irrigation projects for 30 years. When the treaty was formed, the government wanted the tribes to be farmers. Well, we weren't farmers, and uh, you know that was not part of our culture at all. Uh, you know, it was kind of at the time forcing the Indian people to become farmers. And a lot of people didn't want to farm, they didn't know how to farm, they didn't have the resources to, to farm, you know, it cost a lot of money for machinery and, you know, all of, all of that. Initial farming started as early as 1870, as Chief Washakie began to become interested in making the Shoshone more self-sufficient. Indian agent James Irwin supervised the first concerted effort to instruct members of the reservation in irrigation and farming. The first farm started near Fort Washakie and was moderately successful, but the success was not maintained the following year, owing to the fact that Washakie was more interested in obtaining housing for the Shoshone than in maintaining farms. His influence was exerted to encourage the Shoshone to barter work for housing. Private farming activity had increased among the Shoshone and Arapaho by the late 1880s. Farms were plots used by extended family lodges and under control of the tribal leaders. The income was used to provide for band members. This collective farming effort was similar to what Chief Washakie organized, letting the harvest be used as a source of food and income to be distributed among the tribe. Irrigation construction was limited in the following years by a lack of designated funding. In 1894 was the first specifically designated expenditure for irrigation construction and resulted in the beginning on Ray Canal, which is now a part of the Little Wind River unit. The second irrigation construction project was overseen by Captain Wilson. It was the construction of an irrigation ditch from the Little Wind River. The ditch was poorly designed and failed to function properly and was so abandoned. Captain Nickerson, succeeding Wilson in 1898, constructed the Johnstown Canal from the right back of the Wind River. However, by 1899, Walter Graves, the chief inspector of irrigation, determined that too much funding had gone into useless ditches on the Wind River Reservation. Appointed by Nickerson, George Butler determined that five systems were needed on the reservation. Previously constructed ditches, Ray Canal and Johnstone Canal were included, forming the basis for the Wind River Irrigation Project. After the assessment was done in 1901, the Wind River Irrigation Project was developed. It was a means of fulfilling treaty obligations and establishing Indian water rights, as well as becoming economically self-sufficient. Its construction peaked in 1912 to 1925. The project was stalled initially due to funding and water rights that were debated. The McLaughlin Treaty of 1905 provided initial funding for the Wind River and stated that Wyoming state law would be used to regulate irrigation water rights. Article 4 of the treaty provided $150,000 for construction and stipulated that performance of such acts are required by the statutes of the state of Wyoming and securing water rights from said state of the irrigation of such lands shall remain property of said Indians, whether located within the territory intended to be ceded by this agreement or within the diminished reserve. This proved the treaty to be controversial because its funding, it was not provided enough to complete the project and it raised some very serious legal questions regarding legal rights. Construction began on the Coolidge Canal in 1905 and was well on the way by August. Ray Canal began undergoing advancements by October, and construction of the sub-agency canal began in 1907. The Little Wind River unit is compiled of the Ray, Coolidge, and sub-agency canals. It is considered 80% complete, although it is by far considered the largest unit on the reservation. Additionally, there was the construction of the left-hand unit in the same year, which is now considered 80% complete. An extension of the Johnstown unit was done in the same year, which diverts from the Wind River. The Upper Wind River Unit also began in 1907. The Upper Wind River Unit is also known as the Crowheart Unit and includes Dinwiddie, Dry Creek, Meadow Creek, Willow Creek, and Wind River Canals. It is now considered 88% complete. The Indian Irrigation Services also participated in the construction of one irrigation unit outside the Wind River Irrigation Project called the LeClaire Unit. The LeClaire Unit was partially constructed by the Reclamation Project. The unit was located in a portion of the reservation ceded under the terms of the McLaughlin Treaty. Its construction was possible through a concerted effort 
in agreement with the Riverton Ditch Company. It continues to be productive under a three-party agreement between the BIA, BOR, and private ditch company. Work was completed on the main canal of all the project units by 1912, with water being drawn for each system. The diversion of water into the Wind River Irrigation Project was a source of continuing contention that landed the issue in court. The focus was on preeminent water rights. The states was arguing that they had the authority over the Wind River Reservation water rights under Article 3 of the McLaughlin Treaty. The Office of Indian Affairs countered that the doctrine of Indian reserved water rights superseded all other water rights on the reservation. This litigation lasted for more than three years. The federal government ultimately countered that the doctrine of Indian reserved water rights were paramount to any other water rights on the rivers in the reservation. Established in 1868, so our water is prioritized in 1868. One of the two most important water rights cases was the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Winters v. United States in 1908, which stated that the establishment of a reservation implied a reserved right to the sufficient water for the irrigation of Indian lands that supersedes claims by other appropriators of such water under state laws. The Hampleman verdict secured water rights for the Wind River Irrigation Project and secured water rights for approximately 81 private ditches constructed by Indians on the reservation between 1904 and 1926. The controversy over the water rights still continues as does the debate on how to manage and utilize irrigation since the demand for water is so high. Uh, the Shoshone and Arapaho tribes wanted our water, which would justify our water because, you know, the water originates in the Wind River Mountains on our reservation and, and uh, you know, we felt that this was our water and we wanted to use our water the way that, that we felt was beneficial to us. See, there's a lot of reserve water rights that people don't know about. In, but we need uh, I told you to see if you can get a map of all of the uh, Indian lands, I mean all the reservations, and, 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 you know, to see where, where reserved water rights. Litigation did not slow the progress on the project. The majority of the lateral system construction was completed between 1912 and 1925. However, when irrigation funding was reduced in 1925, only a small amount of construction went on. By the late 1920s, the Wind River Reservation was already seeing its fair share of poverty, and the impact of the Great Depression was an especially hard blow. My dad wasn't ranching then. We lived down there at the fort, and he was trapping mostly. He just trapped. I was probably pretty young and didn't really notice it all that much. But I can remember a little bit that uh, I think that they just come around and give Indians uh, beans and corn and stuff like that. And my dad used to go out and, well, he was a trapper, any hunter and trapper, and he'd go out and kill game for the older Indians and then they'd trade us their hominy. And I, when I was a kid, boy, I ate lots of hominy and I thought it was good. And now that I'm older, I don't think I even ate hominy in 40 years. But that's all we had. A new program introduced by Roosevelt, the Public Works Administration, authorized the first major new construction on the Wind River Irrigation Project, the Washakie Dam, a feeder canal for Ray Lake, and the Dinwiddie Canal. These structures resulted from the emphasis on the need for water storage due to severe drought of the early 1930s. We need more for you know, that when I was on the board, that's one of the things I was, you know, wanting and, and uh, a lot of the tribal members wanted. 
And even uh, non-tribal members wanted was more storage, you know, for the water. And the drought, uh, when that when that occurred, uh, the water allocations were decreased. You know, like uh, right now, uh, a good year you get two cubic feet per acre. That would drop to maybe a foot. And then I knew times when it dropped below a foot. So the people really had to conserve water. There are times when we really didn't have any water at all. You know, couldn't get water, you know. we'd Maybe we'd get one cutting of hay and that was it. Mm -hmm. And that happened one summer that I can remember, you know, when Reuben and I were farming, you know, that uh, we only got one cutting of hay that one year because there wasn't enough water to, you know, to irrigate the fields. The last three or four years we had that, but we didn't get uh, water all the way all through the years like we normally do. Because it, it was, uh, the, the ditches were dry by mid, mid June, mid July. And uh, it's, uh, okay, it wasn't that, that tough, but it was, it was tough getting uh, hay. A lot of people are, you know, different countries have droughts, and it's, we weren't that bad, but we had droughts. It's, you know, it's a continuing fight with the state on uh, beneficial use. And, you know, I'm all for beneficial use, and I think all the irrigators are for beneficial use. But to say that, you know, we can't do with the water what we want to do, which we what would we feel would benefit us, uh, you know, as a contrast with the state because they feel like it has to be used only for irrigation. And uh, and I know way back about 1990, right after the court case, uh, a bunch of fish was planted down here in the Big Wind River, and we wanted Midvale to keep you know uh, an in-stream flow, you know, to maintain the fishery. And, uh, you know, that, you know, turned into a big one. Entry into World War II became a time of agricultural prosperity on the reservation and heralded a large number of reservation families taking up farming and irrigation. Of course, my father was on there long before that. Probably in the 30s. Because you know, we've lived in that area, you know, most, well, all of our lives, you know, and then he was farming there. Gosh, since, ever since I can remember, he farmed for about 40 some years, for about almost 50 years. Yeah, so he was on that lawn before we were. I, my father, I don't know when he started irrigating, uh, French and irrigating, because I was, I was about maybe 10 years, 10 or 15 years old when I was irrigating for him. And he had, he had that land probably probably about over 100 years now, because he lived till 76, and he died in 76. And he, he had, we had that land up there, and a lot of people had land down here, farm, farming land down here. Third generation, <clears throat> I'm 65, so I've been all my life. 1944 crop census illustrated only approximately 22,000 acres of land were being irrigated out of a possible 62,000. Only 8.5% of the land was owned and irrigated by Indians, 13% owned by Indians but farmed by whites, and 15% owned and irrigated by whites. This checkerboard occurrence remains an issue today. The tribal members sold their allotments to non-Indians and then when, that, when the sale would occur, then the non-Indian would deed the land, so it went out of trust into the, you know, the, into the deed. When the tribes bought back the land that uh, wasn't under irrigation, some people wouldn't relinquish that, and so you have little checkerboards here and there, even on the, you know, up in the mountains individual turning the water off, you know, on my dad when he was irrigating, you know, and he had a field above us, so he turned the water off up there where we, you know, he wouldn't get any at all, so we'd have to try to deal with him, you know, to get some, and it wasn't, 
I, what little I can remember of that, it wasn't an easy situation. It made for difficult, I'd say really bad uh, community or relationships between the two farmers there. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of the land is leased out to non-Indians on the reservation. And uh, that's why right, the, the non-Indians have all the our, they have all the equipment to to irrigate, I mean to farm, to to ranch. Man, I don't know how this Right up here, you know, when you come through the gate, there's 13 acres out here that's allotted. It belongs to some Indians down in Oklahoma. They all got really... So when we had to get a right away into this place, I had right to everyone permission. Didn't even know they owned it. Like I said, when the rivers went down, you know, our places were the first ones to get shut down. Well, all the people further down, you know, the non-Indian farmers kept getting water until it was absolutely necessary to shut them down. There were two um, people farming on there and there was, sometimes there wouldn't be enough water, you know, for both places, so there was always a battle over that. <laughs> in, in part of the land that we own, there's a um, non-Indian farmer, you know, that lived down next to us. and. Um, and they claimed that there was a right of way for that, but after checking, we found there wasn't. But they had put in a, you know, made a ditch for him and put a um, water turnout for him on our property without our consent. You know? Well, you know, we ha <laughs> I have um, some land that I purchased where there are tons of landowners, you know. I have the majority interest in it, but there's probably about 200 other people that have an interest in it. One of the reasons for the underutilization of irrigable land included problems like lack of farming capital, accumulated and unpaid O&M fees, availability of wage work, weed infestation, poor drainage, and land interests in farming by owner or their heirs. Problems cropped up among farmers and irrigators, and families remember the hardships of irrigation as well as those of the generations before them. board, you know, we would try to get different projects going and uh, we'd get some federal money to come in and then there'd be no follow through you know, with the BIA to, you know, to, you know, utilize the money to what it's going to benefit the farmer. You know, with that irrigation system, that was the biggest problem that we ever had and same problem that my dad had was, you know, the, the maintenance part of it where he farmed and where our old home site is, you know, there, there's seepage that's been there for years and years and nothing was ever done about it. And it, it's gotten really bad. And then down where we are, there's seepage all along through there that's never been, nothing's ever been done about it. The um, turnouts that go to our fields, you know, they haven't ever been changed since we've been there. My father did too before that, you know, he farmed and ran cattle too, the same as we did. And then um, he had all the same issues we've had. And you know, the dirt ditches was, you know, a lot of wasted water, a lot of evaporation, and just, you know, a lot of wetlands being created through flooding. But the, um, the little ditch I built, uh, I mean, I used is full of moholes and the water doesn't get down there. It's good. All the water leaks down into my land, but it doesn't completely irrigate it, but it leaks down there, down, and most of it is alkali. I just use it for uh, pasture, 
-hmm. And I have people went on it every year, and it's <laughs> like I say, you know, where where my uh, parents' home was. Just before you get to the house, you know, there's a real bad seepage area in there, and sometimes it would get so bad, you know, you couldn't drive through there because the water, you know, would get so high, and then it would just run on down into the uh, creek creek bed, you know, that was running along there. The rest of us, you know, from our parents, a lot of us didn't keep that up. There's a few that I can, you know, that I know of that did, but not all the families that were into agriculture, you know, when we were younger continued that. The major problem that faced the Wind River Irrigation Project were the lack of ability for individuals to pay O&M fees, the inability to enforce the collection of the fees, and the only possible penalty enforced was a refusal of water, which only further exasperated the problem. Many tribal members over time felt as though they did not see adequate maintenance on the systems, problems that their fathers faced on the Wind River Irrigation Project as well. Some individuals faced problems like the disbursement of water not being properly regulated, and not having the water that they felt they should. Uh, throughout the years, the Bureau wasn't maintaining the uh, head gate structures, the canals, laterals. I mean, the whole system just fell apart through lack of maintenance. Their main concern supposedly was to maintain, you know, <laughs> which is a big joke, maintain the uh, main systems like the one, you know, coming down 17 Mile Road. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they charge you an awful lot, you know, supposedly for maintenance and operations, but that doesn't happen. Right out here is where the water goes down to a hay field, and we didn't have any water. So we'd have to call somebody and have them come down, and they'd go up and ship the other water off to everybody on up the road. Well, the clean the ditch that I have, you know. Mm -hmm. That was after probably 30 years, you know. And they finally cleaned it. So, but anyway, it's, it's clean, you know. And then the other people couldn't, couldn't. They turned back their uh, le uh, leases, I think, because they said they weren't getting enough water. And our grandson was staying here with us, and old Les had come in, he'd sit at the table, and all the time he was sitting here with BS, and he was still in our water. But Ross would get on his bicycle, and boy, he'd go down the road, and he'd open up the dams, and old Les thought he was really still in the water while he's sitting here BSing, and Ross was right behind him, opening up again, opening the ditch out. <laughs> but we had one ditch rider a long time ago, his name was Elson Sage, and he used to go out there and check them bad. Head gates out there every, every one weekends. And if they were closed up, he'd open them up again, because he was a ditch rider, and that's why we had we had uh, water all uh, all year round. And then in the fall time, we don't get any water. We had a little water problem down here on this ditch. The guys above us would take all the water, and we'd go out here to irrigate, and she was bone dry. There, boy, he just struts up there, and he's telling me all the water rights. I get all the water because I'm the first one on the ditch and I'll do this, I'll take all this. I just sat there and looked at him and I thought, well, I'd be good if you think you can. And Gary said, and I got an Indian air gator. <laughs> and then when we did get short of water, all we'd have to do is just call the irrigation and the ditch riders would come down and they'd check the ditches and get us water. That one time, they would brought the superintendent down and they spoke her said, do you want to come? around the corner up here and off to and all that hay field and stuff. Well, they was just new here. They come from California, bought all that land right in there, and they, boy, they set up a great big irrigation system, and they took all the water. And uh, so we had to complain, and then, I don't know, she had a big fight with the BIA. Despite the change from our traditional path of living to a more agricultural lifestyle, thanks to the Wind River Irrigation Project, irrigation and farming has been taken up by families on the reservation from their forefathers. The Wind River Irrigation Project is utilized by members in each irrigation unit on the reservation. Some remember the rivers changing, others reflect the difficulties of first venturing into the change of lifestyle, and the challenges of continuing it into their generation and beyond. 
find along this, um, you know, the 17 mile area there that is on the same uh, system we're on, it's, it's the younger ones now. I mean, well, we're not young anymore, you know, but our parents are gone. So those of us that continued, you know, you, you won't get, I don't think you'll get a full picture of, you know, the problems they had to begin with or, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, what I know is what, what we had to go through, you know, and how the system has been. Mm -hmm. And it's been a terrible system, to be honest with you. It's never been improved. And even though we pay the high fees, you know, there's really never been any maintenance since we've been farming in this area. Mm -hmm. And you know, a long time ago, just like a woman in high school started the, the vocational building, and I asked them if people could help. I mean, if they could go out and help build the uh, barn from the ranch uh, across for us, and said, "Oh yeah," but it, they don't happen now. And just like the farm, farm program on the reservation said, "Well, we could use their equipment, but we don't. We can't do it." So that's why a lot of people aren't aren't uh, farming or ranching because of the cost. When when we were kids, we used to go down to the river to fish, and you know the fish that we caught, you know, was edible, and even my mother would cook it for us, you know. But uh, anymore now, I wouldn't I wouldn't cook anything I pulled out of the river. <laughs> Too, you know, it, it used to be you could drink the water from the river. But you don't dare now. I remember a funny story about, you know, a couple of our boys, you know, when they were out riding, they forgot to take water with them, and they drank water out of the river, and that was a mistake. <laughs> but yeah, it, it has changed. The water has changed. It's, it's not clean water anymore. It's dirty. <laughs> Long time ago, that's where the people used to live, along the river. Uh, water and everything else. And they used to always, when they moved around, they were always close to water. If you go into sweats and stuff, you know, naturally you have water, you know, when you heat your rocks, you know, you pour the water on the rocks, you know, to, to uh, get that steam going. And, and then you drink it while you're in there also, you know, so, and that, without it, when you drink that water, that's, to us that's sacred, you know, when we do that, you know. You know, we drink that water, you know, because, uh, you know, it gives us life, you know. And we have to be, you know, we have to be happy about that, you know. And, you know, when we, when we drink it, you know, you say a little prayer over it and you drink it, you know. So it's, 